Hello everyone, welcome to Serverless Days from Nature. Uh, we are coming after a very long break and we apologize for that, uh, but we have a great speaker with us today, Ruchi Woman. So uh, he's gonna talk about Lambda uh, Lockdown. He uh, he works at uh, Sonic Wall as a principal software engineer. Apart from that, he is also a community organizer for the AWS uh, communities of Bangalore, as well as for G uh, GTG Bangalore. So, uh, over to you, uh, Ruji. Hey, thank you so much, Ashiva. Thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking at the uh, <clears throat> serverless based Bhuvaneshwar. And uh, let's just get started with what we can actually do to enhance the Lambda lockdown and uh, make the security much better. Okay. So uh, sure. let's get started. Sir, sure. the screen is all yours. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So this is sort of like my promise for the next 45 minutes of the session. And what we are actually going to do is going to set the ball rolling with a generic serverless overview, and then going to give or get started with the cloud and the traditional security, because that distinction is very much important. And then probably dive a little bit into the shared responsibility model, just touch the basics, because that is really essential to understand security in the cloud. And then comes the meat of this section and that is the various scenarios that we could use for the lambda hardening actually for any of the serverless functions or the fast function handling and i'm taking lambda here as an example but most of it is applicable for azure functions or for google cloud functions also right and uh, yeah so we'll talk about that later okay so before that a little bit about me i work as a principal software engineer with sonic Wall. Uh, got a few years of experience and pretty much uh, proficient, sort of like comfortable with security, networking, cloud, and sort of like a systems and a backend person, right? Got a few certifications. I also had a patent which is expired now for cloud security around the distributed data storage and also a specific interest around serverless and containers, right? As from outside work, I organize the uh, AWS user group, the GDG cloud community and the cloud native community of Pandora. Speak at regular conferences, both domestic and international. And I've won multiple hackathons in cloud and also been recognized by Google as a community influencer. Okay. So uh, that, uh, those are my uh, pointers to reach me in case if anyone is interested. Okay. So with that, let's get the ball rolling and then define the serverless and just for everyone, you know, this is sort of like a definition that I picked up from Wikipedia and all of you can read and I'm not going to repeat this, but what I would like to emphasize is the things that have underlined over here, right? It's an execution model, right? Just like anything that is there with respect to the monolith or the microservices and it's sort of like an execution model, which provides the server, right, with the provider runs the server because the cloud, we don't ex explicitly manage anything. The cloud provider is responsible for running everything. So there's definitely server involved in serverless and also, but it's dynamically managed. So that's sort of like the serverless model. And what exactly does it mean? Because it removes the need for provisioning because we don't have to explicitly provision anything upfront. It's all dynamic. It's there by reducing the operations and the management part providing auto scaling capabilities, right? And with the help of abstracting this whole thing, right? We are abstracting the whole computing structure from the user. We are only focused about the code or the business logic that is associated with it. And then it's sort of like an event driven or and whereby you could actually program it to run the things for certain events that actually happens, right? And it helps the way for sub-second build. So this is something that all of us are familiar with. I just wanted to like give a background, right? And how did we actually get this? Because when we talk about serverless, we want to know how the evolution happened. And on the bottom left, you could see that we started with the bare metal, which we are all aware where we buy the server and mount it on the stack. It's still there, right? For all the data centers, it's, that's the thing. And then the gradual evolution with the VMs that came with the VMware, right? Sort of like democratized the whole a virtual machine concept whereby you could actually run multiple <clears throat> loads within the whole bare metal stuff, right? And then came the logical separation in terms of containers with the Docker being the most popular option with Solomon Hikes introducing it in 2013. And then came the functions of SaaS 
with the lambda getting uh, released in i think 2014 or 2015 reinvent i don't specifically remember and that was sort of like a game changing event right and so that's sort of like the evolution that we have so far we don't know what's the next that's going to happen beyond this right so uh, this is the evolution in terms of how we are actually getting in terms of running the various code all of it is running code everything has to serve right so this is sort of like a fun slide that i've put in and so the lo logical question that comes to mind is are we like fixing things that doesn't exist right so because the things used to work perfectly earlier but is there something that we are actually drastically doing something different well actually there is because serverless is sort of like eating the stack and what i mean to say is that serverless is not just the fact right it uh, the aws s3 that is serverless sql the queue management system the email service right ses the notification service all of them are actually serverless so it's not just about running the uh, the fast things because fast is sort of like a small pie within the whole pizza if you look at this analogy the pizza is the sole serverless concept and fast is like a small slice of it right so that's sort of like the distinction that i want to give over here right so because it's very easy to get carried away with fast as just the only serverless concept no that's not it but here in this thing we are going to look at the fast hardening or the uh, and we are taking lambda a sort of like an example over here so with that context i want to define cloud security and again this is a definition that i took from wikipedia but look at the one which i have underlined over here so cloud security is nothing but a policy that is a framework right technologies so that's sort of like the underlying tech that is being utilized to secure the stuff right and it utilizes the controls and the applications that are also involved all of this i have to be utilized and come together or work in harmony and that is used to protect the virtualized ip or the intellectual property the data the applications and everything and all of this defines or combines the cloud security all of them have to be combined as one single thing not in silos right so that's the whole cloud security so this is the uh, that i want to set as the benchmark and it sort of like says that the it infrastructure has undergone a paradigm shift and what exactly is that right because you cannot define the whole cloud security with the traditional concept and to understand that let me give you like a small analogy right when i joined the industry a long time ago this is sort of like the uh, <clears throat> the diagram that was given to be by the it person right the big bad world of internet sitting behind the firewall the corporate firewall protecting the glass house that is the office and that is separating this whole thing right now this is the whole traditional view but now this is the mo modern view that we have right that is we have all this pass sas cas pass das right whatever as right it is just there up in the cloud the glass house is still there that's the modern view right so if all of your workloads are now up there in the cloud should that be a little different the way we think security that also has to change a little bit right because we cannot have the same set of firewall rules or uh, policies to route the traffic or to block out the ports and everything that's not going to work in this modern technical distributed workforce that we have over here right so that's the context that i want to give and <clears throat> what it actually means is so you should be asking this question how should we the cloud security differ from the traditional tech security yes it has to be a lot different and to understand that we need to know the different facets of the cloud or the different distinction that makes the cloud and what it is is cloud is ubiquitous it is always reachable from anywhere anytime any device it is scalable with a click of a button you could scale up or scale out without breaking a sweat right so horizontal scaling and vertical scaling both possible with the cloud and it is deeply integrated right it is it is able to you cannot separate the cloud sort of like six out security right it is there for it is integrated for full stack security right it is comprehensive because the cloud scans every byte ingress or egress including if it's protected and it is intelligent enough and when i say this like 
you remember the aws console that actually got launched when it was first introduced i think 2007 or something when aws got launched and now if you look at the services you actually need like a scroll bar to see the services so that's the evolution that we are talking about right because it is intelligent and the cloud and all the services that are not just aws for gcp or azure or oracle cloud or anything right it's constantly changing it's evolving as per the customer needs more and more services are getting managed and that's the intelligence that we are talking about <clears throat> so the early days of cloud bound mindset was you move fast and put a layer on security on top of it right and so it is move fast or stay secure but now it is move fast and also staying secure because everything is in the cloud you cannot have some sort of like a layer of security that's applied on top it has to be baked in into your source code and that's sort of like the nimbleness that we actually have or we have to strive for right so now let's look at the distinction between the cloud features and the security balances that we actually look at right so cloud is agile but for that we need to have a gatekeeper sort of like a benchmark rules that is definitely needed for the security perspective the cloud is self service of yes that's the whole mark but that doesn't mean that it is away from the standards we need to have certain steps that is definitely there it is built for scale but from a security perspective we need to have a set of controls or definitions that actually we guide it it is automation yes cloud is built for automation but that doesn't mean that everyone does it in uh, their own separate ways no there has to be a centralized way of doing things right so with that i'm going to look into the second part that sort of like the the shared responsibility model before we go into the uh, the other thing and this is sort of like the distinction that i want to draw in terms of the security in the cloud right and so there is cloud security in the cloud and security off the cloud right now if you look at the customer is the one that is responsible for security in the cloud and the cloud platform provider is the one who is responsible for security off the cloud so what does it actually mean to make sure that <clears throat> the whole data center is secure to make sure that the cat6 cables are used in side the data center to prevent eavesdropping to make sure that no employee or very limited set of employees within the cloud provider has access to those data right that is security off the cloud but now what do you mean by security in the cloud okay you spin up a ec2 instance or a azure vm or whatever right and you deploy an application and you just went carefree attitude and you just deployed something without a proper ssl certificate or without a proper rule definitions or without any proper port blockings or anything and you say that your application is now hacked and accessible to everyone and you cannot blame the cloud provider for it because you are responsible for that security so whether in terms of you use the hardened operating system whether in terms of using the proper uh, wire networks or the acl that are there right so that is your responsibility and that's sort of like the distinction that is there and that's the shared responsibility that i want to make sure over here okay so now let's look into the the whole crux of this session and that is the state of the lambda hardware right and this is the lambda that we have it's sort of like a lambda that's built with a fork and a soup spoon which has got sort of like a one star rating and that's a default rating sort of like the aws lambda that you actually use right and now we need to enhance that security so how do we do that because we need to define how this whole serverless thing works and that is which is defined or life which is defined within a vpc right and what it actually means is you provision anything in the aws and it's all resides within the virtual private cloud or the vpc and fast or the lambda should also be provisioned within this sdn wrapper right it's nothing but a wrapper you have the whole network wrapper or the networking thing or the software defined networking and that exactly is the vpc so you define a lambda lambda also defined is within the vpc and the whatever provision or whatever thing that you basically define within that vpc is the lambda itself so if you now define something and you feel like hey i am using lambda and it also runs just for the fraction of a time or if it's ephemeral well you are actually wrong because the lambda is executing within that whole vpc framework 
and whatever restrictions or the network routes or config or firewall rules that you've defined for that particular VPC is applicable for Lambda, even for that fraction or uh, seconds of time, whatever is there, right? So you have to understand that. Just because the Lambda is ephemeral doesn't mean that it is secure. No, a security is only as strong as the weakest link. Okay, so that's very much very uh, very uh, something that you should always remember. So, yeah, this is sort of like my favorite quote: "Talk is cheap. Let's dive deep into the code, right?" And I sort of like have a rule to not do any live coding for any session, right? Because uh, anything can go wrong. So, I what I've done is I've put a snapshots of this code uh, as a slide. And I've also mentioned the link over here, which you could go and go into my GitHub repository and then sort of like download it and see what it is, right? And it, this is purely written in Python so that it's the most English-like language that is easy to find the modern language that is more modern English-like language. Okay, so it's very easy to read. So here is a sample exploit program or a sample, not an exploit program, a sample program which may be exploited. Let me put it that way, right? What it actually does is, it is a CV filtering application, something that a recruitment company or HR department could be using, which accepts a PDF file to perform text analysis or you know the keyword analysis within the resume, right? Sort of like the first level screen, right? Now, the programmer who's written this program in Python has assumed that a user will only provide legitimate PDF filings, right? Yeah, it could be like runc.pdf or something like a username.pdf, right? Whatever, that's the assumption, right? My resume will always be neatly formatted. Now, this is the whole weakness that is there in this, right? And what it says is the file name is embedded directly into the shell because yeah, I mean, the programmer thought that it's gonna be normal, Alpha numeric characters dot PDF, which is going to be processed, and this has command is actually linked into it, right? Right. So now, a potential programmer could actually do this. This is a valid file. You have something foobar, okay? Let's run C, and then you separate it with a semicolon. You get the environment. You pipe it into a curl, and you pass it into an attacker site dot PDF. And what actually dumps the whole environment variables within your AWS thing, right? Or it can be used to basically run a exploit code or an RCE remote code execution from Lambda. This is very much possible, right? So <clears throat> this is a sample program that is being written, which can be used to invoke RCE code from Lambda, right? So there is definitely a scope to inject stuff. So the Lambda is ephemeral, yes, but it can be used to run this if there is a bad syntax. So this is just an example. Now, what we actually have to do are the various exploits that the attacker could use to use that loophole which exists in the program to do the other things, right? So now exploit one number one, is basically talking about the subprocess invocation at will from the execution context, right? So what it actually means is, here is a program that is basically touching or creating a file which is there, right? So it's just creating, a, you are using a subprocess to open something which is there, okay? That's sort of like the first one. And then you are creating a, a text file within that, Right? And this is all running within the Lambda context, right? And you could use that to list the process IDs that are being used for the whole thing, right? So now this is a program that's written in Python 3.7 in the AWS Lambda context. And you could use that to execute commands like PS3 to list the whole process and it dumps into the slash TMP folder with that text file. So this is definitely possible. So you could invoke any number of subprocesses from the execution context, right? And that could be definitely happen. Now the second exploit, and that is talking about the access function handler of the serverless function, right? So you could use that to basically see what is there. <clears throat> so here you could see that it is opening a file again, 
right? And you could use the os.system command. And what I'm doing is I'm chatting the Lambda function. So the any code that you write, if it's a Python code, goes into slash var task, right? And you could use that to get the code function. So you could dump the whole Python code within your Lambda to this particular thing. And you could just use that as a read context to see what the code is happening. So that is also very much possible. This, so bear in mind, all of these exploits will only work if your program itself is vulnerable. If your program is not vulnerable, then none of this is working, okay? So that's sort of like an important takeaway that I wanna give. So that's the reason why I gave or started this example with sort of like a bad program, a bad programmer who assumed that the legitimate file names would only be the ones that will be provided. So that was a loophole which could be used to exploit these things. So that's first exploit and second exploit, okay? So I'm just gonna reinforce that. So I sound like a broken record, but that's sort of like a thing that I wanna give, right? And the third exploit that I wanna talk is we access the slash TMP to manipulate the contents that happens during the execution back, right? So here, this program, what happens is you open a file, slash TMP, you do it a write, you write some stuff into the slash TMP Lambda for the Lambda execution environment, and you open it. So now all slash TMP folder that actually is there, which exists during the execution of the Lambda for whatever time that is there is now yours. You have the whole file system in someone else's Lambda environment or someone else's uh, AWS environment, right? Yes, it is only ephemeral, but it is yours. You have now remotely uh, entered into that file system using some sort of like an exploit, okay? So these are the other third exploits that I wanna talk about. <clears throat> so a uh, sample demo exploit that I've provided you before, with uh, provided you have like a really bad program. Now, how do we now stop it, right? And this is something in Python known as a monkey patch. Well, so what exactly is a monkey patch, right? So it's a basically a technique to dynamically update the behavior of a piece of code. It's not just Python, it is there in other languages also. I think it's there in Node as well. Uh, and in other languages like Go and C++ and everything, I guess it's some other name, but you could actually enforce it to write something else or what you actually mean, right? And why it's there, it's typically used is to extend the behavior of the modules, classes or methods. So when you want something to be done for a particular action, instead of the original action, you want something else to be done. So that exactly is the monkey patch, right? And the scenarios are you want to extend certain functionality for the library, you want to do some testing uh, for you know unit testing or dev testing that you want to do for certain modules during the development process, and also to maybe like quick fix issues if you don't have the resources. So this is, we are basically using that as the first one because we are going to modify the behavior at the runtime. So this is our behavior that we want to do. So anything with like respect to the OS.system command, which is the most vulnerable system code, uh, we are gonna basically change that behavior, right? That's what we're gonna do over here. So here's a sample patch that I've given, okay? Now, if you look over here, I have basically eclipsed the original definition of the OS.system, right? So now a good program, what it should do is the attacker is assuming that if there is a loophole into my program, just like how it was in the CV filtering application, the attacker is gonna use the OS.system command to basically execute the various stuff, right? So what I'm gonna do is I have changed the definition and I have changed the OS.system into something else, which only I know as a programmer. So instead of using OS.system, I use something called as a safe underscore system or something else, run C safe system, right? That's my program. That's gonna do only for the system command, right? So that's known only to me. I don't know anything else, right? So instead of using the default one, I'm gonna use the safe system. And now, if anyone else who tries to use the OS.system, it will just print the first one saying that it is not supported. So even though your program is now hacked because of some other vulnerability, it will never work because you have to use a safe underscore system, which is not possible to be extracted. So now every time, you want to use the OS.system, you use safe underscore system. 
and that can be used to invoke any number of system commands right so this is sort of like a good patch uh, sort of a way or a monkey patch way of doing things because it is definitely possible to exploit fast even though if it's ephemeral right so uh, <clears throat> now you sort of like made a a killer looking lambda right as compared to the other one which was made with like a fork and a soup spoon now this is much better it's got a crowbar and it's got a five star rating and that's it's, it's sort of more more killer looking fast application as compared to the alter default lambda definitions that we have right so <clears throat> with that uh, i think yeah we have just about on time uh, and i can possibly open it up for any questions or comments or i don't know if what's the format that we actually follow over here or uh, we could do that so we normally uh, keep 5 minutes for the q and a so okay. uh, let's wait a bit for the uh, for anyone who's you know joining in live to ask the queries or questions from the session in the meanwhile uh, would you be open to share any of the links so that you know people can go back and uh refer those links to explore more about this topic yeah definitely i think uh you could definitely check out my other <laughs> thing about uh, the link that i've provided over here tinyurl.com/fastexploit it's i think a link to my github repository that has all of this code which could be used to patch uh not just lambda but also for the gcf and uh, the google uh, and the azure functions and any of the fast things so to speak right so that's sort of like the exploit uh, definition that i've provided which could be possible does it make sense so uh, so what i can request uh, richi is that you can paste that particular link in the private chat so that i can paste it in the comment section for others sure. to just click on that and go to the particular page so we'll list free for two more minutes for some of the queries if we don't get any we can call it a day Sure, sounds good. Let me just do that in the private chat. Okay. Okay, so uh, guys, we have pasted the link in the comment section. If you wanted to explore more about this topic, you can always use this link and go to Winji's uh, repository and explore more about this particular area, subject matter, uh, subject area. So, yeah. um, and I'm also available on Twitter, and that's my uh, homepage where you could reach me on, you know, Twitter on GitHub or anything, and then uh, I'll be free to answer more of your questions. So guys, if you're feeling shy to ask questions in the comment section, you can always reach out to Rinchi from using his social media handles and uh, clarify yeah. your doubts with him. My so, DM is uh, awesome. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so thank you everyone for joining in on a Sunday, and uh, thank you Rinchi for uh, accepting our invite and joining us. And you know there were a couple of delays in in scheduling this particular session, but Nevertheless, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Have a great day, and we'll be coming. We'll come up with another session next month. Stay tuned uh, for the updates. You can always check it from our LinkedIn page as well as the Twitter handle. So that's all for the day. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye bye.